special looks good. Calling up. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down phenomenal. Why did not try to feed off? Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Hello and welcome everybody. You are looking live at Launch Vehicle 0008 on the pad in Cape Canaveral, Florida at Space Launch Complex 46. Astra is just under 60 minutes away from conducting a launch for NASA to deploy four CUSAT payloads into low Earth orbit on the NASA ELENA-41 mission. This is the third launch attempt for Astra and Astra's first mission from Cape Canaveral. We are coming to you live today both from Cape Canaveral, Florida and Astra's headquarters in Alameda, California. My name is Thomas Burkhart. I'm the news director for NASA Spaceflight, and I'm joined by Carolina Grossman, director of product management at Astra. Carolina, thank you for joining me once again today. Thanks for having me again, Thomas. Always a pleasure. We will be bringing you this live coverage of today's mission as we have previously. Astra and NASA Spaceflight are once again partnering to bring this livecast to you. So thank you to Astra for partnering with us to make that happen. And also, as usual, we will be taking your questions throughout the course of the broadcast. So if you have a question about today's mission, please tag us with at NASA Spaceflight in the chat. We're going to be bringing those in through uh, Michael's nifty software, and we'll be asking as many of those as we can throughout the course of the broadcast. Right now, we're at T-minus 57 minutes and counting, so carrying that a Let's start off with a status update. What are the teams working on as we proceed towards liftoff? Sure, Thomas. As you can see, that middle third of the rocket is a uh, nice frosty white as propellant load um, is ongoing on the, onto the vehicle. And all things are looking nominal. And you can see it's also a beautiful day in Cape Canaveral. We are not tracking any weather issues at this time. So um, we are going to proceed through our countdown with a T0 time in 56 minutes and 30 seconds. The 40 Space Launch Delta 45 and the 45th Weather Squadron predicted a greater than 90% chance of favorable weather today. And as you can see on your screen, that has definitely played out crystal clear skies, hoping for some amazing visuals from today's launch. Liftoff is also on track for the opening of today's window, which is 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, uh, which is, again, just about 56 minutes from now. And this mission is the first from Cape Canaveral for Astra. It's launching from Space Launch Complex 46, which is on the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. On board this rocket are also the first satellites which Astra aims to deploy after a successful orbital launch. Those four payloads are part of NASA's ELENA program, the Educational Launch of Nanosatellites program. The mission is designated ELENA-41, also designated the VCLS Demo-2 mission for the Venture Class Launch Services program, which aims to provide dedicated launch services for small satellites like these CubeSats. Uh, three of the CubeSats are provided by different universities, uh, the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, uh, New Mexico State University, as well as California Berkeley, and then the fourth payload is direct from the NASA Johnson Space Center. All three U-sized CubeSats on board, uh, and uh, those are the payloads on board. Ashton's first mission to deploy payloads into orbit, like I said. Um, and as Caroline mentioned, no weather or technical issues right now. The countdown is proceeding. Over the course of the broadcast, we'll also keep you updated how that countdown is proceeding with any updates as needed. Um, this mission does build off of the first successful orbital launch from Astra, which was the LV-0007 test flight out of Kodiak Island, Alaska. And let's take a look at a, at a quick recap, which, which uh, shows how Astra got to today. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, six, one, zero. First motion. First motion. Vehicle is still in the tower. Confirms good startup. Seco. And Astra's LV 0007 has successfully reached orbit. There is a new orbital rocket. And we are now going to welcome a special guest to today's live coverage. Heymanth Charazia is a Vice President of Product Management at Astra. Heymanth, thank you so much for joining the live broadcast today. Thanks so much, Thomas. It's great to be here. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about what you do at Astra and how you contribute to the team. So your role is Vice President of Product Management at Astra. What are your responsibilities in that role? Yeah, uh, great question. So I'm part of the product management team at Astra, and you've met Carolina Grossman, one of the stars of our team. Overall, the product management team is really all about answering the question of what is the right thing for Astra to build next. And that's based on understanding what the market is deeply, understanding what our customers need, and understanding what we can build. Uh, you can imagine that that's a very cross-functional activity, um, but fundamentally it's about charting that course forward uh, and creating a few different things. One would be our North Star vision for the products that we're building and the roadmap of releases that in step-by-step step get us there towards that North Star vision. You mentioned this being sort of a, a cross, uh, you know, you know, a cross kind of capability where you have to work with other people. Do you work closely with the engineering and operations teams when you're developing these new products? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, engineering and operations are two very, very critical elements uh, of of the company to engage with in answering these questions. But also, so many others. Uh, you know, I think of program management, I think of production, sales, mission management, finance, regulatory, space sports. Uh, so many, there, there's a long list of internal and external stakeholders that every one of them uh, has an important piece of the puzzle in understanding what is the right thing to build next that makes the most pro progress towards our vision for Astra. Well, when aiming to grow your teams in order to pursue that Astra's or kind of overall overarching goal as, as a company, um, what kind of skill sets and backgrounds are you looking for to join the product management team to achieve those goals? Yeah, great question. And uh, we're actually hiring very aggressively right now, uh, looking to dramatically grow the product management team this year and it, as we expand the scope of what we're building at Astra. Uh, so your question is a good one. I think there are a few key skills that we really look for. I would highlight four. The first one is customer obsession. We were really looking for people who are obsessed with understanding who the customers are and what their problems are and how we can help solve those problems. And then bring those insights to the rest of the team as part of our product development process. Uh, second thing I would highlight is it's important to have a combination of technical fluency and business thinking. Uh, so product managers in this process, as you can tell, are really a bridge between the business side of Astra and the technical side of Astra. And so it's important to be able to work uh, and speak equally well with both. Um, third one is ability to learn fast. You can see on the pad today, our launch system, you know, our most celebrated product at Astra, uh, is really the first of its kind. There are no other container shippable rockets. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is a first in so many different ways. So everybody in the product team really has to be able to learn fast about new technologies, new markets, new types of businesses. And then the last thing I would say is Ability to bring people together, uh, ability to convene, to influence, uh, to really align a broad cross-functional team around a vision for the product, a thing we're trying to do in the world, and then to ship that, to work together to bring that into reality. And uh, so these four key skills uh, are intrinsics we look for, and we, we have great people in our team right now. Uh, in terms of backgrounds, I would say that uh, product managers in aerospace are a bit of a rare breed. It's not really a traditional role. Uh, so there isn't any cookie cutter formula for background. Certainly, uh, people who have had product management experience at other companies that build uh, mixed hardware and software products, they will have had an opportunity to build many of these intrinsic skills we're talking about. So that's a great background. But also, it doesn't have to be that. Um, and also, it doesn't have to be any particular industry. At Astra today, we already have a very diverse range of backgrounds at, at Astra. People have come from automotive, from big tech, from aerospace, from all sorts of different industries, and we hugely value that. It's really an important part of the magic at Astra about building something that's fundamentally different as a new future for the space industry. And so, that team, which comes from all of those different diverse backgrounds and experiences, is all bring, coming into Astra to achieve Astra's kind of, or aim towards Astra's long-term goal of improving life on Earth and uh, from space. How does today's mission, the LV0008 mission, and your work as in the product management team work towards achieving that goal? Yeah, great question. And uh, I love this question. It can never be asked too many times. <laughs> uh, I think 
Big picture, a really important step in improving life on Earth from space is to develop the scientific understanding and the scalable technologies that we'll need to build something really useful in space, the next generation of space-based services. Um, that's really what I see as the theme of today's mission in a few different ways. Um, and the four satellites that we're launching today from three awesome university teams and NASA's Johnson Space Center. The way I look at it, uh, the four satellites we're launching today advance two broad goals. The first one is to help scale up our use of space. And the second is to do that more sustainably. Uh, so on the first theme, this scaling up, uh, the first one I'll highlight is the R5-S1 mission from NASA Johnson Space Center. They're really demonstrating a faster and cheaper way to build CubeSats and simultaneously testing out new ways to get better data on how satellites are operating on orbit. This is very useful diagnostic information for scaling things up. The second payload that fits in this sort of theme of scaling up is the CubeSat mission with a Q from the University of California, Berkeley. And they're testing out a new kind of quantum gyroscope. A gyroscope is a critical element of every satellite on orbit that helps the satellite understand where it's pointed and where it is. And uh, making these, uh, th this quantum gyroscope is one potential, potential path to smaller, lighter, and cheaper gyroscopes. That's another way to scale things up in space. Overall, these two give us new ways to make cheaper uh, and more scaled satellites. On that second theme, though, on sustainability, I would say that uh, the first one, the BAMA-1 mission uh, from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, will test a new drag sail, which is a bit like, you can think of it like a parachute in space. Um, now, to, to really improve life on Earth from space, we need to be able to safely operate thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. And an important part of that is to be able to very reliably bring satellites down when they've either failed or otherwise reached the end of their life. Uh, a drag sail is one promising solution to that problem, part of the suite of solutions. And the BAMA-1 mission is taking a, a really important next step in the development of this technology. Uh, the, the final payload I'll, I'll highlight is the Inca mission from the New Mexico State University Las Cruces. Uh, they're using a neutron spectrometer to take a new kind of measurement of space weather to better understand space weather and predict it. Now, maybe uh, many people in our audience don't think about space weather every day. Uh, what this really is, is to recognize that our sun is a dynamic and powerful force that's constantly emitting a stream of high energy particles towards the Earth. And that, that bombardment of the Earth creates a space version of weather that satellites need to fly through and operate in. Turns out that it's really important for satellites to to account for this and for us to understand what they need to be designed for in terms of space weather. Just this week, uh, for example, in the news, we saw uh, a, a large number of satellites lost on orbit purely due to the impact of space weather. So what the Inca mission is doing is really on an important topic to understand and better predict space weather. I'd say as sort of a backdrop to all of this, there's something here for Astra, which is the launch today is Astra's next step in expanding access to space. Uh, why do we care about that? Well, this is exciting for us because easier access to space means more great student teams and researchers flight testing new technologies on orbit. It means more entrepreneurs building valuable space services on orbit. And it means more governments and institutions building systems that benefit everybody in the world from space. And I think from my own days as a student at MIT, I've seen firsthand how awesome the innovations can be driven by a team of students and researchers at a university lab. And, uh, but historically, it hasn't been very easy to get those things into space, to flight test them. Uh, and so it's, that's why, for me, it's such a huge honor today to be watching us give an opportunity to fly payloads in space from these great student and researcher teams. And uh, so I'm very excited to see them fly and to see Astra take its next step in expanding access to space. Absolutely. Hey, Mon, thank you so much for joining us. I've loved hearing all that insight into both today's mission and your role in the product management team. So thank you so much for taking some questions with us and hanging out. Thanks so much, Thomas. All right, let's go ahead and listen into activity on the countdown net as the countdown proceeds at T minus 43 minutes and counting.
Okay, per step 105, Tango in AV1, manage polling. Please toggle to both ground and guidance polling mode. Toggling to both ground and guidance polling. And Tango, I'd like you to re-enable pump battery charging by going into machine, pump battery two, manage pump batteries and setting mode three, reset machine. Toggling three, reset machine. And then mode one, charge pump batteries. Toggling one, charge pump batteries. So we just listened in on some countdown steps being proceeded. Again, everything on track right now. We're at just under 42 minutes and counting for today's launch. Again, targeted for 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Like we said, we want to take some questions from chat over the course of today's broadcast. So again, if you've got questions, tag us with at NASA Space Flight, and we're going to be bringing a couple of those in, and we got a few of them here now. Um, Keith is asking about the last launch that Astra conducted, the LV-0007 mission. What was the goal and achieved objectives of that mission, Carolina? Yeah, so the LV-0007 launch uh, in November, we saw the video of it just a few minutes ago if you, if you joined us at the beginning of the broadcast. Um, that was uh, our, our attempt to reach orbit. Um, we have constantly been, been working towards that milestone and LV-0007 successfully re reached orbit uh, with a test payload on board. And, and so that, that test payload uh, on board LV-0007 was not deployed. Um, so today's mission, LV-0008, represents a few firsts, one of them being that this is the first Astra mission with payloads that we will deploy into space, as you just heard um, a lot about these, these exciting CubeSats and, and the scientific investigations that they will conduct. And uh, it's also our first launch out of Cape Canaveral. So um, it's a couple of, of historic firsts for, for Astra with, with today's launch, and we are very excited to see how it goes. And a related question, uh, Arda is asking if Astra can launch payloads into polar or retrograde orbits, and I believe that ties in directly with the launch site that's being used for any particular mission, right? Right. So um, if you have been following us for, for a while, we, we have launched our previous rockets out of Kodiak, Alaska, the Pacific Spaceport Complex, Alaska. And, um, and that location, um, which is a very high latitude, is great for reaching high inclination orbits, including polar and SSO. Um, so yes, we, we can reach polar, polar orbits. Um, and uh, technically, those, those uh, uh, retrograde would be you know, flying, uh, uh, launching against the direction of, Earth, of Earth's rotation. So there's nothing really to prevent us from doing that either. But uh, we're focused on the objectives that our customers want to achieve. And a lot of that is driven by our launch location. So um, while our Kodiak launch site has um, been great at helping us reach high inclination orbits, this launch site in Cape Canaveral is really wonderful for reaching mid inclination orbits, which are particularly important for um, things like communication and weather observation, where um, you're, you can get more coverage over the middle portion of, of the globe. Another launch site question here from Matt. Could Rocket 3 launch from a boat at sea? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our, our approach to our, our launch infrastructure. So um, everything that you see in front of you here can be f shipped inside a shipping container. Um, and so uh, no, no launches at sea at this time, but it does make it very easy for us to set up and deploy a launch site. Um, and uh, and even the rocket itself is uh, 43 fi feet from uh, tip to tail, so that fits inside a 45-foot shipping container. A bit snugly, um, but it is one of the key differences about Astra, where we can um, we can ship everything to the launch site, and really all we need when we get there is um, a concrete pad, an internet connection, and uh, and a fence to uh, help keep uh, keep the area safe. And we have another question in chat asking about, again, kind of related to launch sites. A lot of launch site questions, which is good, because first launch from Cape Canaveral, it's on topic. Um, does each vehicle get built slightly differently according to where it's going to end up eventually launched from? That's a great question. Um, and no, that is one of the things that um, helps us 
on our path to on our path to scale and really improve life on Earth by um, improving access to launch. So the rockets are uh, built as identically as as possible. Um, we may make small tweaks in between because our objective is always to to learn and improve our system. However, those at this point um, those have been uh, pretty minor, especially given the success of the LV triple zero seven launch back in November. So we do make the rockets identical. It doesn't matter where where they are um, launching from. They are um, exactly the same. The only difference is maybe any uh, changes in uh, our communication systems to ensure compatibility with the specific range and any special payload adapters that we need for that specific mission. Otherwise, um, it's the same rocket regardless of where we are launching from. And looking at the launch site a little more closely here, we have a question that we should have known we were going to have, although this is an interesting interpretation of this question. Uh, what are the pylons that look like they'd attract lightning for? Well, you pretty much got halfway there. Uh, actually, on this particular camera view on the very left-hand side, you can see the bottom part of one of the lightning protection towers, and they are there, like you said, to attract lightning. It helps protect the rocket. Um, and L uh, Sla Space Launch Complex 46 has uh, two big prominent lightning towers uh, seen here as well uh, to help protect the rocket. But of course, this pad is actually built for rockets. It's, it's one of the smaller pads at Cape Canaveral, but still built for rockets that were traditionally bigger than Rocket 3. So Rocket 3 is just barely poking up over the trees in this view. Uh, even this pad makes uh, Astro's rocket look small because it's dedicated to those small satellites. Uh, another question here, uh, Paul asks, is what makes Astra different from its competitors? What strengths do they have that other providers maybe don't have? That is a wonderful question. And Astra, our mission is to improve life on Earth from, from space. And the way that we're hoping to do that is by developing the most responsive and affordable orbital launch system. Um, so in, in terms of responsiveness, what we were just talking about um, with our ground support equipment, fitting in shipping containers, being easily able to um, set up and uh, and tear down a, a launch site in, in a matter of, of weeks or, or days, um, that's one of our key advantages. And the reason that that's important, as we mentioned, is that um, a, a lot of the or orbital destinations that you can reach um, depend on where you can launch from. So being able to be mobile and agile um, helps us to um, provide customers with, with access to the locations they want. The system is also really set up by a very small team of folks on the ground and operated by a small team of uh, mission control and support engineers in our, in our facility, which allows us to be really nimble. And it's also been really helpful during the COVID-19 pandemic where it's allowed us to remain as safe as possible and minimize our travel. And finally, on, um, on the affordability front, um, we take pride in, in using low cost materials and trying to lower the cost of access to space with our with our vehicle and I believe that uh, Thomas you you had a, a tour with our our of our facility with uh, with our uh, head of production and and uh, that's that's an ex been an exciting thing to learn a little bit more about um, how we we go through um, the steps to make our system as as uh, affordable and low cost as possible, including you know, staying away from fancy materials like uh, carbon fiber and, and composites and using as much automation as we can across our system. Yeah, Carolina, you set me up for a shameless plug here. If you have not seen the Rocket Factory tour with Bryson Gentile, who was the b b head higher up in the production side of things at Astor, who gave us NASA Space Flight a tour of the Rocket Factory a little while ago, it is on the NASA Space Flight channel. I highly recommend checking that out uh, because it's a wonderful insight to how Astro is working to lower that cost through different means. Because, you know, some companies are looking at reusable rockets and things like that as a means of cutting down price, where other companies such as Astro here, you're talking about revving up production cadence of expendable rockets and simplifying the launch uh, preparations and simplifying the manufacturing, the different materials you choose. Those are the kind of factors you're looking at to reduce launch prices, right? Yes, exactly. That's that's right. We we take a number of steps in order to make our system as, as uh, cost effective as we possibly can. And hopefully um, our customers can take advantage of that and get more payloads to orbit. 
And speaking of getting those payloads to orbit, we have a question from Redacted. I don't know if that's their actual name or if I just am not allowed to know the name, but we'll go with it. Uh, the question is, what's today's trajectory? Is it flying direct east or somewhere else? I believe we even have a graphic to show where the rocket will be headed, and there it is, right on cue. Yes, so so this is um, uh, the trajectory that the rocket will follow. Um, there will be we'll, we'll be following sort of that that middle area. Those blue lines um, are the the note mars, the notices to mariners, the the area that boats will keep away from, and then the red area is um, sort of our, our safe area that that we um, have cleared with the with the FAA. So um, after the rocket um, clears this this trajectory, we'll be flying. Um, Starting, starting to swing around uh, towards towards uh, the south again, flying over Portugal, Spain, the Sahara Desert, um, Ethiopia. Um, so we'll we'll be hoping for um, for a nominal trajectory as we launch out of Cape Canaveral. And if you are down here in Florida, along the Space Coast, or even along the southeastern coast of Georgia and things like that. Um, Assuming the weather is clear where you are, it is very clear here at Cape Canaveral. Highly recommend taking a look at this launch because the weather does appear to be pretty favorable for launch viewing. It is a different rocket than the ones that normally come out of here at Cape Canaveral, so it might look a little bit different, but uh, rocket engines are pretty bright and hopefully you'll be able to catch a view. If you're local to Cape Canaveral, highly recommend this spot here, NSF Stephen Marr out there in the field uh, near Jetty Park, and uh, that is a really great viewing location, the best one for complex 46 because that launch complex is actually on the southern tip of cape canaveral uh, pretty close to the port canaveral area so highly recommend heading out here 31 minutes from now uh, this launch will hopefully be taking place and we'll put on a cool show for the space coast here in florida if you are not local here to the Space Coast, we are, of course, thank you for tuning into the webcast. Happy to provide you uh, with the views of the launch of this way. And we have a question from Sean who asks, um, or excuse me, I'm reading the wrong thing. Uh, different question from K2, K81. I don't know what that means, but thank you for your question. Uh, are there any cameras on board the rocket? And if Michael gets that cue, he's going to show one of those cameras. There we go. Uh, Carolina, what are we looking at on these views? Sure. So you are looking at the upper stage of LV0008. So that the sort of top right hand side um, of your screen, that is the fairing. And we will we will hopefully see um, very shortly after a main engine cutoff, we will have stage separation and fairing separation. Um, and those fairings will pop open and we'll have a beautiful view of Earth as the upper stage ignites to complete the final leg of the mission. And then this is a view uh, looking upwards at our, at our payloads. Um, so we'll be um, tracking them as they deploy um, after, after SECO, our second engine cutoff. Love seeing those onboard views. We're hoping to keep those throughout the course of the broadcast and show those much as much as we can. We've also got these ground cameras, of course, and uh, with perfect visibility, hopefully we'll get some good views from them as well. Um, I do have a question from Planetary Space, which is talking about the most recent abort and scrub. If you tuned in earlier, this is not the first launch attempt, like I said. This is the third attempt for this particular mission. And last time, there was that scrub due to that telemetry issue that the teams had to stand down to resolve uh, prior to coming back today. Um, but we saw that abort happen right at engine ignition. So the question is, what do the teams have to kind of work through when you light a rocket engine and then scrub? Is, could the engine be damaged from an abort like that or other systems? that have to be inspected and things? Sure. So first, to, to speak a little bit about the abort that happened on Monday. Our team conducted a data review after our engines lit, and we learned that the abort was due to the rocket detecting latency in our internal telemetry communication. And it was a bit longer than we typically experience. We determined that it was unlikely to have impacted flight, but felt that it needed further review. And after this review, the team was able to identify the probable cause and potential effects um, and run some simulations to determine that an impact of flight was unlikely and also test some adjustments to improve the latency of the system um, in preparation for our launch attempt today. So we, we believe we have solved that issue. Um, and now more directly to the question, our system is actually designed for multiple ignition um, ignition events. Um, so we we complete a static fire of the vehicle. It's, it's our last major test of, of the full system. Essentially, we we run through our entire countdown procedure, load propellants, light the engines, um, and run them for a few seconds, and essentially do everything except actually release 
the rocket. Um, so we, we do design the system to be able to um, to complete multiple ignition attempts, multiple launch attempts without damage um, or, or issue. Excellent. We're actually hearing that teams are getting into final software config loads now. So let's go back in and listen to the countdown net as those steps are completed at 27 minutes and counting. They're 1-5 on engine alpha. Good load. Engine Bravo, 175, Victor 15. Loading config 175, Victor 15 on engine Bravo. Good load. Engine Charlie, 176, Victor 15. Loading config 176, Victor 15 on engine Charlie. Good load. Engine Delta, 177, Victor 15. Loading config 177, Victor 15, engine Delta. Good load. Engine Echo, 178, Victor 17. Loading config 178, Victor 17 on engine Echo. Good load. Ether, please provide an updated late load config if you have one. Ether, late load config 183, Victor 8. Loading config 183, Victor 8 on Ether. Good load. GNC, do we have a late load config? Yes. 5, Victor 148. Loading config 5, Victor 148 on Guidance. Good load. Tango in VB1, turn on off PDBs. Please run a GNC setup. GNC call out when complete. Toggling GNC setup. So as you just heard, teams are working on those final software loads and those are going well. Team minus 25 minutes and counting, all on track so far. Um, so we'll keep some questions coming and uh, the, t the liftoff is still targeted for the opening of the window at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. This question from Sean for Carolina. How big is the launch window today should any issues have to come up? Right, that's a great question. We have a one hour launch window today. Um, so our launch window extends from uh, 12 p.m. Pacific 1 to 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I am blanking on my <laughs> UTC math at the moment, um, but we do have a 60 minute launch window. Um, if, the, if we encounter an abort or an issue, um, our recycle time is typically around 15 minutes um, once that issue is resolved. So there is a possibility that we would be able to try again in the event of an abort. But again, everything looks nominal at the moment. So we are not anticipating any issues at this time. If I use the time you took to answer that question and to do some math in my head, I think that translates to 2,800 UTC to 2,100 UTC uh, for those of us watching or those of you watching from across the globe. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, that is our launch window for today. James I have another here, question here. here from Santosh who asks, what engine does the rocket use? And I'll just expand that really quick because I believe we have a cool view of all the different components of this rocket. Carolina, want to run us through what makes up a Rocket 3 from Astra? Sure. So uh, on the left side of your screen, you can see the expanded view of, of our rocket. Um, we'll start from the left. That is uh, the, the engine bay. You can see three out of our five first stage engines, the Delphin engines. They are electric pump fed engines, each producing a thrust of 6,500 pounds um, for a total of 32,500 pounds of thrust on the first stage. The next large section is the first stage tanks. Um, and those are filled with LOX and ker kerosene, liquid oxygen and kerosene, which are our propellants for both um, stages of the vehicle. Um, the next section is our inner stage, which houses the uh, large portion of the upper stage and our avionics system. 
Um, then further right, we have um, those two uh, uh, spherical tanks um, and the and smaller engine with the long uh, nozzle extension. That is our upper stage. Again, the upper stage is filled with LOX and kerosene, just like the first stage. And we have one pressure-fed ether engine, um, which produces 740, 740 pounds of thrust. Um, and then finally, you see those two split um, halves of the fairing. Um, and uh, on top we have of the, of the upper stage, you can see an example of a CubeSat payload. Again, today it represents Astra's first mission deploying uh, customer payloads into orbit. So we will be keeping an eye for that fairing separation and the payload deployment at the end of our mission. Awesome. Chat, please keep the questions coming. If you've got a question, tag us with at NASA Spaceflight. That'll help us see your questions. And we're going to keep asking those as we get further into the countdown here. The current time is T minus 22 minutes and counting, and all systems are nominal. Let's listen in to the activity on the countdown net as the teams continue to prepare for liftoff in just under 22 minutes. First up, 132 GNC at this time. Can you confirm that wind profiles still look acceptable for launch today? Confirmed. This takes us to final igniter checks. First step, 133 Tango. On the buttons interface, please toggle Spark for 30 seconds. Upon completion, Delphin, please provide results of Spark test. Toggling Spark now. Delphin, please confirm results of spark test. Delphin confirms good spark. Fabi, thank you. Thanks. And you just heard a good spark test, so igniter tests have been completed and the countdown steps are proceeding nominally. We're under t uh, just about to cross T-minus 19 minutes and counting. Everything going well so far. What you were listening there to there was the mission control teams in Alameda, California, working through those countdown steps. And Kalina, can you walk us through who those team members are and their various responsibilities today? Sure. So um, we just have this graphic that has popped up with their names. We'll start from the top left today. So. Um, we have Rose Jornalis, who's our flight safety. Um, the flight safety officer is responsible for um, making sure that we are following our, our trajectory. Then Christopher Rossi is our GNC guidance navigation control or trajectory. Um, so he's the one who is keeping an eye on our winds and making sure that um, we are safe to launch and follow our, our planned path. 
Um, Claire Gauthier is our vehicle controller who with the call sign of Tango. And um, she is the one who is doing the steps to load the software on the vehicle. She's the one who is the, the operator of our launch system. Chris May is our command and data handling, or CDH, and he's responsible for monitoring and adjusting any of our state machines which operate our, our system. Uh, Hill Hudson is our flight activities officer, or FAO, and he's responsible for documenting the completion of our procedure. Uh, Chris Hoffman is our flight director who oversees and directs launch vehicle operations following the countdown manual, and he can call hold, recycle, or abort as required. Um, and then we don't have a tag for um, Eric uh, Stein Steinberg, uh, known as Steiny, who is our um, IT and uh, network um, uh, point person. You may also hear as we move through the countdown um, the and the the no the go no know. go poll, which is which is coming shortly. Um, we have a what we call the engineering backroom of the responsible engineers for each of the different systems on the on the vehicle and our ground support equipment, um, who are distributed throughout our factory floor at their desks and monitoring all of their systems there. In addition to those teams at Alameda, there's a, the, another group team, another team out in Cape Canaveral, code known as the Red Team. And can you tell us a little bit about who's out there for us? Yes, we have a, a very small and nimble team um, known as the Red Team out at Cape Canaveral. They are the ones who set up the launch site, do any work required to um, to configure the vehicle and the ground support equipment for flight. We are very grateful for them and hope they're enjoying the beautiful Florida weather, which is much nicer than it would be in Kodiak this time of year. Uh, we have Ryan Hirschfeld, our safety officer. Adam Frisch is our red lead. Robert Freeman, Eric Larson, Sam Hirschap, Benjamin Whelan, Rusty Haller are our red team. Um, and then we also have, in addition to Steiny on our network and IT, we have Thomas Cannon as well. So um, all of six members of the red team are are, we're very grateful for all of the work that they do on the ground at our launch site. Um, they are taking regular COVID-19 tests to protect the health and safety of everyone involved in this mission. Um, and uh, thank you all, huge shout out to you. For sure, right now 15 and a half minutes to go. Again, everything on track so far. At the T minus 15 minute mark, there will be the entering of terminal count. And uh, that is gonna be a big milestone. There'll be some other steps right after that as the teams get into that terminal count, followed by a go no-go pull just over 10 minutes to go in the countdown. So let's go ahead, listen into the countdown net. We should have a water test incoming and then entering terminal count. takes us into Astra Terminal Count this time, step 142, Tango, confirm that in AV1 manage power systems, we are in ground power system authority. Confirm. Tango in VB1, turn on off PDBs, please run a GNC self-test. GNC, call out upon completion. Running GNC self-test. We'll go. GNC self-test passed. Copy. Astra Safety confirm that FTS is still enabled and nominal in the vehicle. Safety can confirm. Tango. As the teams get into terminal count here, let's take a look at the mission timeline of all the events we'll expect to see after liftoff. Carolina? Sure. Um, well, before liftoff, just a few seconds before the five first stage Delphin engines will light, and at T0, if all of the checks pass, 
um, we will have lift off. The hold down mechanisms will release the vehicle and we will be at the beginning of our journey. Uh, just a few seconds in, we'll begin our pitch over maneuver and expect to reach max Q at around one minute and 10 seconds. That's the point of maximum aerodynamic stress on the vehicle uh, and a significant milestone to hit in the first stage of flight. Um, then a few things happen in pretty quick succession. At two minutes and 50 seconds, we'll have main engine cutoff for Miko, then bearing separation and stage separation um, right before the upper stage ether engine ignites at three minutes and five seconds. Um, the ether engine will burn for about five and a half minutes before second engine cutoff for Seco at eight minutes and 30 seconds. And then at eight minutes and 40 seconds, we will uh, begin our payload deployment of our four CubeSats, um, which will be deployed in a few seconds of one another, and we are hoping to get a good view of um, from our onboard cameras. And if we, will, if we have completed all of those steps, we will have achieved uh, mission success and we'll consider today a very good day. All right, let's listen back into the countdown net. We're coming up on that go, no-go poll, which is where Chris Hoffman will pull the rest of the team for their readiness for launch. And uh, hopefully we'll get a go condition to proceed with launch in just over 11 minutes. So let's take, let's listen in. Toggling off chill, toggling off load first, toggling off load oh, over, board. deactivating Hawks 4 operate. Deactivate OX-1 OV-201 first fill. Deactivating OX-1 OV-201 first fill. OX-1 OV-401 fill. Deactivating OX-1 OV-401 fill. Deactivate OX-1 OV-301 upper fill. Deactivating OX-1 OV-301 upper fill. In fuel four operate, please toggle off first and full. Toggling off first, toggling off full. Please deactivate fuel four operate. Deactivating fuel four operate. Deactivate fuel three supply. Deactivating fuel three supply. Fuel one FV three zero zero upper fill. Deactivating fuel one FV three zero zero upper fill. Fuel one FV two zero zero first fill. Deactivating fuel one FV two zero zero first fill. Deactivate AV-1 radios. Deactivating AV-1 radios. And AV-1 rocket support cart. Deactivating AV-1 rocket support cart. Please confirm zero stop purging is still enabled. Confirmed. AV-1 manage polling. Confirmed. AV-1 manage power systems. Confirmed. The helium stack. Confirmed. Please activate igniter one spark test. Activating Igniter 1 spark test. Please confirm VB1 first stage power is active. Confirmed. VB1 upper stage power. Confirmed. VB1 turn on off PDBs. Confirmed. Water 1 water system. Confirmed. Tango, please activate launch machine. Activating launch machine. With launch activated, please toggle locks topping. Toggling on locks topping. Okay, team, this brings us step 151. Pull for tank pressurization and launch today. After this point, any system issue must be called as a three word hold. That is a hold, hold, hold over the net. If there are no concerns for flight, call go. Otherwise, call no go. Red lead. Red lead is go. FTS. FTS is go. Dolphin. Dolphin is go. Ether. Ether is go. Odin. Odin is go. Inco. Inco is go. Ace. Ace is go. Launcher. Launcher is go. Orbit. Orbit is go. Booster. Booster is go. GNC. GNC is go. FAO. FAO is go. CDH. CDH is go. Tango. Tango is go. Safety. Safety is go. Flight is go. Tango and AV1 manage polling. Please toggle do only ground. Toggling do only ground polling. 
And let me know when you're ready to load flight engine sequences. Ready. Delphin, please provide. Igniter sequence is 703, Victor 3. Loading sequence 703, Victor 3, on igniter. Good load. Engine alpha is 860, Victor 1. Loading sequence 860, Victor 1, on engine alpha. Good load. Engine Bravo 861, Victor 1. Loading sequence 861, Victor 1, on engine Bravo. Good load. Engine Charlie 862, Victor 1. Loading sequence 862, Victor 1, on engine Charlie. Good load. Engine Delta 863, Victor 1. Loading sequence 863, Victor 1, on engine Delta. Good load. Engine Echo 864, Victor 1. Loading sequence 864, Victor 1, on engine Echo. Good load. Ether, what can we load for you? Ether sequence today, 842, Victor 3, please. Loading sequence 842, Victor 3, rinse and repeat on Ether. Good load. Tango and AV1 manage pulling, set us back into do both ground and guidance pulling mode. Toggling. All right, you just heard the teams have pulled go for launch and are into the final steps before liftoff. Carolina, this mission is about to lift off. What is the purpose of this mission? Once more, one more for people who are just joining us. If you are just joining us, Astra is looking to deploy four CubeSats on this mission. Bama-1 from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, demonstrating a drag sail module that will rapidly deorbit the satellite. Inca, ionospheric neutron content analyzer from New Mexico State University, Las Cruces, which is a scientific investigation mission studying the neutron spectrum in low Earth orbit for the first time. Uh, CubeSat from University of California, Berkeley, a technology demonstration to test and characterize the effect of space condition on quantum gyroscopes using nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. And R5S1 from NASA's Johnson Space Center, Houston, uh, demonstrating a fast and cost-effective way to build successful CubeSats. These are being launched on the Alana 41 mission, um, which is selected through NASA's CubeSat launch initiative and provided under a Venture Class Launch Services Demonstration 2 contract, which provides dedicated launch capabilities for smaller launch payloads awarded by NASA's Launch Services Program. So we are very thankful to our partners at NASA for providing us the opportunity to complete this mission for our four CubeSat uh, payloads. Coming up on T-minus five minutes and counting, we're going to go ahead and listen back into the teams as they work through the final minutes of this countdown. And we'll be looking forward to a liftoff again, liftoff targeted for 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, which is just under five minutes from now and everything on track so far. Reminder to all that any three-word hold from here on out is, will be an immediate abort, regardless of source. You can see the crew at our Astra headquarters gathering to watch the launch. I'm very je jealous of Thomas, who will be stepping away from his desk for a moment and, uh, and hopefully watching our launch in person. Got a nice crowd of spectators over at uh, Jetty Park as well, hoping for a nice view of LV0006, excuse me, LV0008. Three minutes and 30 seconds. Brock, this is flight on countdown. Please confirm range is recording telemetry at this time. Confirmed.
Control room, if you require RF data in flight, be prepared to switch over your pages. MIFCO, flight on countdown. MIFCO. MIFCO, prepare to issue option when rocket IIP marker passes Minmiko point and is within dispersed trajectories, calling out at event. MIFCO copies. Two minutes and 30 seconds until T0 of the Alana 41 mission. FTS at this time, send master enable and watchdog on AFTU. Two minutes. Copy, thank you. Ninety seconds. Ace at this time, start PSD recordings and downrange ground station recordings. Good work. Sixty seconds, vehicles on internal power. Five, first stage coming up to lift off pressures. Tanks are pressurized at this time. 30 seconds. Twenty. Fifteen. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, zero. LV triple zero eight has launched and is on its way to space. You can follow the flight milestones on the left side of your screen, as well as the velocity and altitude of the vehicle. Our next objective is Max Q. Should have passed through max Q. All systems on the vehicle are nominal. And we are tracking it downrange.
we'll be looking for Miko or main engine cutoff at T plus two minutes and 50 seconds. Clear skies have provided a great view of LV0008 so far. MIFCO, option sent. FTS, Copy. FTS confirms option detected. Safety can't confirm. That call out of the option means that the system will safely be able to ignite the upper stage after Miko. our stage separation. And that was MIKO, our main engine cutoff. That was fairing separation and stage separation. And you can see that the upper stage ether, ether engine running. has lit. Opening FV 200A, opening FV 300A. Opening OV 202. <laughs> And it looks like we've lost video of the upper stage and standing by for more information.
James, James right here. here. Thanks for standing by. We're still waiting for more information on the LV0008 mission. Right now you're seeing a view of our pad at Cape Canaveral, where the team is securing the area.
and thank you for standing by with us. Um, unfortunately, we heard that an issue has been experienced during flight that prevented the delivery of our customer payloads to orbit today. We are deeply sorry to our customers, NASA, the University of Alabama, um, the University of New Mexico, and the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, more information will be provided as we complete a data review and you can follow along for updates on uh, Twitter at Astra as well as on our website, Astra. Well, everyone, thank you for tuning in for today's live coverage. And thank you to Astra for partnering with NASA Space Flight and allowing us to broadcast this launch to everybody. And again, stay tuned for further updates from Astra and from NASA Space Flight. Uh, but thank you all so much for watching and uh, stay tuned for more information. But uh, we'll see you later. Thanks, everybody.